Welcome back. So today we're going to be talking about the basics of language, the very basic things that define human language, set it apart from other communication systems. And we're going to talk a bit about what it means to describe a language scientifically. So basics comprises the very bottommost rung of the ladder. Before we get into the stuff like phonetics, phonology, and so on, we're going to have to figure out, we're going to have to pin down what is this thing called human language? What do we mean when we say language? What counts as a language? What doesn't count as a language? Let's take a look. What is it exactly that distinguishes human language from other communication systems? Things like the bird songs. If you go outside in the morning, you might hear these beautiful chirping bird songs surrounding you. The birds are communicating something to each other. Their songs seem to have an intricate structure. Is that a language? Do animals have anything like human language? We're going to see. Also things like uh, digital communication systems, programming languages, the ways that computers communicate with each other over, over the internet. These are communication systems. Are they like human languages? Could we call them languages or are they something else? The basic properties of human language are communicativity, semanticity, cultural transmission, displacement, productivity. So these are five of the core properties of human language. They don't really exhaust all of human language. I'm going to take each of these in turn now and talk about what they mean. When we look at other communication systems, natural and artificial communication systems, we will see that all of them have some of these five properties. Only human language has all five. So each, so like animal communication, computer communication, things like the way that information is encoded in DNA. These are systems that have some of the properties listed here. Only human language has all five. Human language is defined by having all five of these simultaneously. Let's take them in turn. Communicativity. The first one is the most basic. Communicativity just means that it's, you have a system which is used for communication. Human language is used for communication. Other systems are also used for communication. Communicativity implies some things about how language must be. It implies there must be a way to produce and perceive utterances. An utterance is just any, uh, you know, anything that someone says or writes. There has to be some way to produce an utterance, which means there has to be some way to create a physically observable signal, which comprises that utterance. And there has to be a way for someone else to perceive that utterance. So you might hear what I'm saying, or you might read what I'm saying, two ways of perceiving my utterance. A system can only be communicative if there's a way to produce and a way to perceive, because otherwise there's no way for one person to communicate with another person. So production refers to the processes by which we create the physically observable signal that we send to other people in language. Production means things like moving your mouth to talk, or moving your hands to produce a sign language, or maybe typing to produce written language, or handwriting to produce written language. Those are all forms of production, producing the physically observable signal that gets sent to someone else. That other person will then perceive the signal. By seeing it, or feeling it, or hearing it, using their senses, they will perceive the signal that was produced. Communicativity means you have to have both of these functions. Now, there are different ways, as I've talked about, different ways that you can produce and perceive language. These different ways are called modalities. And I'm going to talk now about three of the different modalities that human language can exist in. Modalities are the ways that language is produced and perceived. The most common modality for human language is what we call the auditory vocal modality. That means that production consists of talking. It consists of moving your mouth and vibrating your vocal cords in a certain way that produces an acoustic signal that propagates through the air. And the perception consists of hearing. So it goes into the ear into the auditory cortex of the person you're talking to. 
So this is spoken language. Auditory vocal language means a language which is produced by talking and perceived by hearing. The most common kind of language, but not the only kind. The other major kind of language, the other kind of modality, is what's called visual gestural. In this case, production consists of signing with the hands and with the body and with the face. This refers to what are usually called sign languages. So for example, American Sign Language is a language which is produced by signing with the hands and face and body and perceived by vision. It's perceived by the other person who sees the signer who is signing. These visual gestural languages like ASL, which stands for American Sign Language, these visual gestural languages are full-blown languages. Now, if you haven't studied linguistics before, haven't studied sign languages before, maybe you just think about these as sort of gestures that enable people to sort of communicate in an ad hoc way. That's not true. Sign languages are complete languages. They have all the same structure as spoken languages. The only difference is that instead of being produced by talking and perceived by hearing, they're produced by signing and they're perceived by seeing. The last major kind of modality for human language now, these three kinds of modalities, they don't exhaust all the modalities, but these are the three major ones. The last one that you have probably dealt a lot with is the visual written modality. This refers to written language where production consists of writing, any process by which you create physical marks on a page or on a screen, which is then seen by someone else who reads that text that you wrote. So visual written language consists of language which is written and then perceived. This is actually the odd one out here. You might think about visual written language as somehow the basic form of the language and then the spoken language is just sort of a way of communicating uh, vocally. But in fact, the auditory vocal language or the visual gesture language is typically the more basic thing. The visual written languages that exist are all originally just representations of some auditory vocal or visual gestural language. So writing is also quite new. We're going to talk about this soon. Let's think a bit more about these different modalities. Auditory vocal modality. This is, as I said, the most common form of modality. All known cultures, all known human cultures, where you have a large enough percentage of people with normal hearing have auditory vocal language. This is actually pretty interesting and incredible. There is no known community of people that has ever been found which does not have a language. And as long as they have a large enough percentage of people who have normal hearing, they have an auditory vocal language with the same kinds of structures that we're going to be seeing throughout this class. These languages can be learned without instruction. So you learn an auditory vocal language by interacting with a community freely or perceiving a language as it's produced, you don't have to be taught. You don't have to be explicitly taught an auditory vocal language. No one has to sit you down and give you rules and say like, well, this is what the word cat means and the word the has to come before a word like cat. It can't come after a word like cat. No one has to sit you down and explicitly tell you the rules like that. You just pick it up in a natural way. Now, some of you might have been taught rules like that, you might have been taught, um, you know, this is what you should say, this is what you should not say, but you would have learned the language fine even if you weren't taught that. Now, if you learn a language later in your life as a second language, you do have to learn it somewhat more explicitly. Some people are capable of learning it without explicit instruction. Some people uh, benefit more from that ex explicit instruction. But the basic case is that a child can learn an auditory vocal language without instruction by a sort of amazing natural process which you can learn more about if you take the class in language acquisition in the language science major here. The visual gestural modality, sign languages. These exist in all cultures where you have a high enough proportion of deaf members. So there are occasionally communities in which a very large percentage of the population is congenitally deaf. And if it's around 10%, Typically, that community will develop a sign language. Often, it will have an auditory vocal language, and then it will also have a sign language within that community. These sign languages develop naturally. They don't have to be designed by someone. And just like 
auditory vocal language, they're picked up naturally. They don't have to be explicitly taught. You don't have to go to a school to learn a sign language. You can just grow up in a community that uses it and learn it. And as I said before, sign languages have all the same structure as auditory vocal languages. You shouldn't think about them as some kind of approximation or some kind of stripped down form of language. They have all the same structure as auditory vocal language. Now in this class, we're going to be focusing on auditory vocal language. That's not because sign languages aren't important. That's just because that is the kind of modality that we're going to be focusing on in this class in order to build up linguistics. But you should keep in mind that all the structure I'm going to be talking about, including stuff like the structure of sounds, applies to sign languages, where structure of sounds wouldn't refer to structure of sounds in that case, it refers to the structure of signs. So sign languages can also be learned without instruction. Now the visual written modality, as I said, this is sort of the odd one out, and I'll talk about why that's the case. Writing is a recent invention, and it's an invention. Someone came up with writing. So writing, the idea of writing down language has been independently invented by people at least four times in human history. And that's interesting because it's a really small number. Remember I said that all communities have a spoken language, but the idea of writing only came up, people only came up with the idea of writing four different times in human history, at least. Probably not a lot more than that. And writing being 5,000 years old is a lot younger. It's a much newer idea than spoken language. We don't know how old human language is. It is at least 50,000 years old, probably a lot older. It's certainly a lot older than written language. Not all cultures have written language. Remember, all cultures have either an auditory vocal or a visual gestural language, but not all cultures have a written language. Remember, this was only invented four times, and there's many people still that have not been reached yet by writing systems, by the idea of written language. All writing systems started off as representations of some kind of auditory vocal or visual gestural language. So, you can think about written language as something that's, which sort of starts off as a way of representing an auditory, vocal, or visual gestural language, and then it sort of takes on a life of its own and becomes its own kind of language in its own right. So for example, we can read and write in dead languages, things like Latin, which no one speaks as an auditory, vocal language natively anymore. In that case, you have a language which only exists now in the visual written modality, but all visual written languages started off as a representation of some auditory vocal language. The key point I'm trying to drive home here is that writing is a sort of secondary thing. This maybe is, is a bit surprising. When it comes to language, writing is not the original thing when it comes to language. Also, learning to read and write requires explicit instruction. Unlike auditory vocal language or visual gestural language, you don't just pick up writing. You have to go to school, you have to do drills, someone has to teach you the letters, you have to go through years of training in order to read and write. And in the vast majority of human history, the vast majority of humans never learned how to read and write. So it's actually best to think about writing as a kind of language technology. It's the first language technology. And we'll get to that much later in the class when we talk about the characteristics of writing systems. So, to sum up this idea of communicativity, communicativity means language is used for communication. That means there must be a way to produce and perceive utterances. A modality is a way in which language is produced and perceived. Auditory visual language means that you produce by talking, you perceive by listening. Visual gestural language means you produce by signing and you perceive by vision. Visual written language means you produce by writing and you perceive by reading. So that's communicativity, and now I'll move on to the next core property of human language, which is semanticity. Semanticity means that all of the forms in language have a meaning or a function. Remember that I said in the first lecture that we can think about language as a pairing of form and meaning. 
form being something like the written word cat or the sound cat. When it's written here, this is in the visual written modality. And the meaning is whatever is evoked in your mind when you perceive the word cat or whatever the speaker is intending to get across when the speaker says cat. Semanticity means that we pair forms with meanings. There's some connection between the form and the meaning. When we consider the form and the meaning pair together, the form and the meaning considered as like, you can think about it as two things that are paired together in a shared structure like this, that is what we call a sign. A sign is a pairing of a form with a meaning. So English contains within it this particular sign, the pairing of the sound cat or the written form C-A-T with the meaning of this furry creature that runs around. So how exactly is this linking accomplished? We have form on one hand, we have meaning on the other. What is that connection between them? This is a subfield of linguistics, which studies how exactly that connection is accomplished. Semiotics is the name of the subfield. Semiotics is the study of how exactly a form is linked with a meaning, and there's different ways it can be done. What exactly is the connection between this sound cat or this written word C-A-T and this creature whose image is evoked in your mind when I say cat? How is it that I can produce this sound and you have this meaning in your mind? What is the connection? There are essentially three ways in which form can be linked with meaning. These correspond to three kinds of sign. The first kind of sign is what's called an icon, and we say that this means that the relationship between form and meaning is iconic. Icon means that the form actually physically resembles the meaning. Here's an example of an icon. Just I'm going to show you a symbol, or rather I'm going to show you a, a thing, a form, and I want you to guess what the meaning is. So think about what this means. It is a bicycle. Obviously, this means bicycle. Why do you know that this means bicycle, even if you've never seen this before? Well, because it looks like a bicycle. The form here, this little cartoon shape, that's the form, it physically resembles a bicycle. And so, in that case, the link between the form and the meaning here is what we call iconic. It's an icon. The form physically resembles the meaning. Now I'm going to show you another thing, an index. Let's take a look and think about what this means. What does that form mean? Well, you might think it means poison. You might think more generally this refers to anything which could cause you to die if you interact with it in some way, right? So this is not an icon. This doesn't look like a dangerous substance. This rather is an index. In this case, the form resembles a result of the meaning. If you, if you see this on like, a uh, beaker of some liquid, that means that if you drink that liquid, you're going to end up looking like this. You're going to end up looking like the skull and crossbones. It's going to mean if you interact with a thing that bears this mark in any way, this is going to be the result. An index means that the form resem resembles the result of the meaning, the meaning here being something like poison or dangerous object. That's an index. And then the last major kind of sign is what's called a symbol. This is the most important kind of sign for human language. In a symbol, the form is associated with the meaning arbitrarily, by convention only. There's actually no inherent link between the form and the meaning. It's just an, a convention of the community you're in or the game you're playing. It's a convention that that form goes with that meaning. So what do you think this means? This is a symbol. Just looking at it, uh, yeah, you, it doesn't mean anything. It's just a, a squiggle. It's maybe a bit evocative, but you really have no idea what this means. Now, I could tell you it means something. I could tell you that something like going on in this class from here on out, when you see this symbol, this thing means, I don't know, something that you really need to remember. I'm going to put this next to the things you need to remember. I'm not really going to do that. This is just an example. The idea is that I could associate this arbitrary symbol with any given meaning by means of convention. 
A symbol is a case where the form is linked to meaning only by convention, not by any relationship, any inherent physical relationship between the form and the meaning. So let's look at some examples. I'm going to show you some examples of signs that you might encounter in your life. And I want you to think about whether this is an icon or an index or a symbol. Is the relationship that the form resembles the meaning or that the form resembles the result of the meaning or that the, there's just an arbitrary association? So first of all, what does this mean? Think about what it means. It means, uh, you can, it means there might be people crossing the street. And what is the relationship between form and meaning here? Take a moment to think about it. It's iconic because it actually looks like someone crossing the street. So that's an icon. How about this one? All right, this is a sign. What does it mean? It means yield. It means that if there's another car going, then you need to let that car go and not try to get in front of it. What is the relationship? between the form and the meaning here? Is it an icon, index, or symbol? Well, let's think. Does it resemble the meaning in any way? No, not really. Does it resemble the result of the meaning in any way? No, not really. So it's a symbol. There, it, you learn, when you learn how to drive, that this sign means that you need to yield. It's a symbol. It's an arbitrary convention. How about this? What does this mean? It means there's ice on the room. Is it an icon or an index or a symbol? Take a moment to think. It's an index because if there's ice on the road, you might swerve. And what this thing shows is a car which has swerved. It shows a result of the meaning. The meaning is there's ice on the road. The result is that you might swerve. So you need to drive carefully. This is an example of an index. How about this? The English word cat, the English form cat. Is it an icon? Is it an index? Or is it a symbol? Well, does it look like a cat? No. Does it look like the result of a cat? No. It's a symbol. It's an arbitrary pairing of a form with a meaning. And the vast majority of words, and the vast majority of language in general, consists of these symbolic links, arbitrary linkings of form with meaning. So there's the English sign for cat. So, as I said, the vast majority of these associations of form with meaning in language are symbolic, they're arbitrary. This is a sort of famous property of language. If you're like a philosopher of language, you think a lot about the arbitrariness of the sign. The fact that this link between form and meaning in natural language is usually arbitrary. It's just a matter of convention in the community. This idea was first articulated by this fellow Ferdinand de Saussure, a famous and fundamental linguist who made very important contributions to the beginnings of scientific linguistics. One way that you can tell that the sign is arbitrary in this case is that the form corresponding to this meaning in other languages is totally different. So in Spanish, the form here would be gato. In Hungarian, the form would be mochka. These are forms that are different than the English form, and they're also all totally unrelated to the actual physical form of a cat. So if you speak any languages other than English, you should think about what is the word for this thing in your language, and is that an arbitrary mapping of a form with a meaning? Now if you say speak Chinese, Mandarin Chinese, you might think, oh well the word for cat in Chinese is mao. That kind of sounds like a cat, doesn't it? It sounds like one of the sounds that a cat makes. So it might actually be the case that a few or some of these linkings of form and meaning might not be totally arbitrary. They might be somewhat iconic. Mao sounds like a cat. It physically resembles the sound a cat makes. It's a, it's a little bit iconic. So is the sign really always arbitrary? There are examples where it's not. So for example, the English form of the word buzz as it is produced in the auditory vocal language, it sounds like what it means. What it means is the sound that a bee makes when it's flying around, zzz, and buzz indeed contains a sound like that. When this happens, 
and there is this iconic relationship between form and meaning, then this is what we call onomatopoeia. Onomatopoeia is when a word sounds like its meaning. And in visual gestural languages, you have a lot more examples of this iconicity. You have a lot more signs that somehow physically resemble the thing they refer to. In auditory vocal languages, though, this onomatopoeia is the exception rather than the rule. Most of the time, the linking between form and meaning is completely arbitrary. Sometimes there is an iconic element to it, as in onomatopoeia. So semanticity. That means that every linguistic form has a meaning. Language consists of pairs of form and meaning. A combination of form and meaning is what's called a sign. The three kinds of sign are the icon, the index, and the symbol. Most linguistic signs are symbols. That's the arbitrariness of the sign. Although some are iconic and we call that onomatopoeia. The next key property of human language is what we call cultural transmission. Cultural transmission means that you learn a language from other people. You don't innately speak a particular language like English or Spanish or Chinese. Languages propagate by cultural transmission. The language you learn is determined by the people you interact with. It's not that you are born as someone who is innately going to speak, say, Japanese. Rather, you pick up the language from the people you interact with. The language you learn is not determined by anything other than the people you interact with. And that means that languages propagate solely by transmission from person to person via interactions. There are no known genetic or hereditary influences on what languages you can learn. Every human is capable of learning and using every human language. It's not like some people have an ability to learn one kind of language and other people have an ability to learn others. Every human can learn all human languages. This is actually different than other communication systems we see in nature. So remember I talked about the beautiful bird song that you might hear in the morning, this intricate sound produced by many different birds. That bird song, the patterns of that bird song in many cases are not learned by the birds. They don't learn how to sing from other birds. Rather, they're just born with a certain song that they produce. For example, this little fellow here, this is a European pied flycatcher. This bird is born essentially knowing how to sing its song. You can raise this thing in captivity away from all other birds. It's never seen another bird in its life. It will still sing the same song. It doesn't learn that song from any other birds. That's actually not true of all birds. Some birds actually do learn their songs from other birds but many of them just come with the song sort of pre-programmed into them genetically. Human language is not like that. Human language is propagated by cultural transmission. Bird song in many cases is propagated by genetic transmission. That's cultural transmission. Now the next key property of human language, and this is really maybe the thing which is the most rare among communication systems, is displacement. Displacement means the way that we use language to talk about things that are not immediately perceptible. So the best way to show you what displacement means is actually to give you an example of a communication system that does not have displacement. So I'm going to play a little example video here about alarm calls. These are a communication system that is used by vervet monkeys. When they see a predator, they produce a particular sound and that warns the other monkeys that that predator is around so that they can run away or do whatever it is they do. Let's watch the video, it's pretty cute. All these monkeys have different alarm calls for different predators. Watch this. So there's a leopard he's bringing out now, or a jaguar. And let's see how the monkeys react. Wait for it. That's 
through leopard alarm call of the Diana monkey. And that totally different one is the spot nose. But the important point is that all species of monkey in the alliance recognize one another's call and know the nature of the enemy. So these monkey alarm calls, they're a lot like human language in the sense that they, they're, they have semanticity. That particular call that heard, that particular eh, 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 tittering sort of call you heard, that means leopard. That's a pairing of form and meaning. It's arbitrary and culturally transmitted. Those monkeys actually learned those calls from other monkeys. And you'll notice that that sound they were producing, well, it doesn't sound like a leopard. It doesn't sound like the result of seeing a leopard. It is an arbitrary pairing of form and meaning. So this is starting to look a lot like human language, right? But it's missing a very, very key aspect of human language. These alarm calls, the monkeys can only make a call when they see the predator. When they actually visually see the predator, then they make this alarm call and they know that they should run away. And another monkey that hears that alarm call knows that it should run away. But human language isn't like that. The monkeys cannot use that alarm call to talk about a predator which is not present. Monkey alarm calls don't have displacement. So I'm talking now about leopards and I'm talking about monkeys. Look around you. Do you see a leopard? Do you see a monkey? Uh, I, I don't know where you are, but probably when you look around you, you don't actually see a living leopard or a living monkey. We are talking about leopards and monkeys, even though they're not physically present. So these alarm calls, you see the leopard and you say basically leopard, 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 leopard. On the other hand, human language, we can talk about leopards. I can tell you something like leopards have spots. I've communicated information to you about leopards, even though there's actually no leopards in front of you. That's displacement. Displacement means we can talk about things that are not immediately present. It's one of the things that makes human language enormously powerful because I can tell you something like there's a snake in the jungle. Now you know not to go in the jungle. I don't have to wait until I see the snake to actually say that, nor do you. So that's displacement. And the last major property of human language. Again, this is something that really sets human language apart from the other communication systems out there is what's called productivity. And this is really getting to the heart of the structure of human language. Productivity means that linguistic units, which means the utterances that we use to speak, linguistic units can be recombined in order to express novel meanings. And again, it's best to show this with an example. I'm going to show you some examples of words, like here's the word good. And I want you to think about two things. Think about, have you heard this word before? And think about, is the meaning of the word clear? So I can take good. I can add ness to it. That's a morpheme. I can jam these two morphemes together to get a new word, goodness. Have you heard this before? Almost certainly you've heard the word goodness before. Is the meaning of the word clear? Do you know what this means? Yeah, it's pretty clear. Here's another example. Bad. You've heard that before. Badness. You've heard that before, maybe. You've probably heard it less than goodness. Badness is maybe a sort of odd word. You've probably heard it before, though. And I think we'd all agree that the meaning is clear. Now here's the kicker. Pine-scented. Well, you've heard that before. You know what it means. Pine-scentedness. What if I say like this uh, brand of freshener is well known for its pine-scentedness? Have you heard that word before? Have you heard pine-scentedness before? Probably not. You've never heard that word before. Is the meaning clear? Yeah, the meaning is perfectly clear. This is not a word you would find in the dictionary, but it is a word in the sense that I say it and you know what it means. So what we've done here is we've taken parts and we've combined them together in a new way that you've never seen before that still makes sense. So pine-scented, you know what that means. Ness, you know what that means. I put them together to get pine-scentedness and you know what it means. So this is what we mean by saying that linguistic units can be recombined to express novel meanings. This implies that you can actually express an infinite number of different meanings, different new ideas, simply by recombining the parts 
of language. Language is like a bunch of Lego blocks. You can combine them together in novel ways to make words and sentences which have never been uttered before, but which still make perfect sense and are easy for people to understand. Here's another example of productivity. Here's a sentence, my hovercraft is full of eels. Now you've probably never heard this sentence before unless you've seen this Monty Python sketch. This sentence consists of a sequence of words that you've never seen put together before. And yet you're perfectly capable of understanding what this means. The meaning is absurd. It's crazy, but it still brings to mind an image. It's perfectly easy to understand what this means. It might be hard to understand why someone would say this, but it's not hard to picture what's going on when you say, my hovercraft is full of eels. That's productivity. You can put the pieces of language, the words, together to form utterances that are new, that have never been said before, and yet it's still easy to understand. It implies, in fact, that you can produce an unlimited number of different meanings, express an unlimited number of ideas. The majority, in fact, of sentences that you hear day to day involve combinations of words that you've never heard together before, and yet you're still able to figure out the meanings of those sentences. Typically, a language has something like on the, on the order of 50 different phonemes, which is units of sound. They combine together to sort of form something like 50,000 different words. Those, that's something like the number of words that you know as an adult speaker of a language. And those words can combine together to form an unlimited pos number of possible sentences. So that's productivity. And we can now synthesize these five different properties of language we've talked about into a kind of definition of human language. Language is a learned system of signs that enables us to communicate an unlimited number of meanings about any topic. We can identify each part of this definition with one of the key properties of language. So when we say it's a learned system of signs, that means that it is culturally transmitted. It's not like bird song where you're just born you know, singing a certain song. It's something you learn from other people. It's a system of signs. That means that we have these pairings of form and meaning. It enables us to communicate. That means that we can produce and perceive language. The number of meanings we can express in meaning in language is unlimited. That comes from productivity. And we can talk about any topic. We can even communicate about things that are not physically present in front of us, and that is displacement. So that is our, at least for now, our definition of human language and some of the basic properties of human language. Now, in the second part of this lecture, I'd like to go into a second question. What does it actually mean to describe a language scientifically? We've established sort of what a language is, and now I want to talk about how do we characterize a language? When I say a scientific description of a language, what do I mean by that? What does that look like? The key distinction to make here is between two things called descriptive grammar and prescriptive grammar. A descriptive grammar is a description of how a language works, how a language as spoken by its speakers actually works in practice, how the structure of the language actually is in the minds of those speakers. Now, when you've learned grammar in school, when you learned when you went to class and they said, now we're going to learn grammar, you might have learned things that look like this. Don't end a sentence with a preposition, says the teacher. Don't use passive voice. Don't use words like less with a count noun, like less customers. You should say fewer customers instead, says someone. These statements are not descriptive grammar. These statements are what's called prescriptive grammar. Prescriptive grammar is someone's ideas about what makes for correct use of language, usually correct writing. Prescriptive grammar is anything someone has told you that's of the form, this is how you should use language. You should not end a sentence with a preposition. You should not use the passive voice. Prescriptive grammar is someone trying to tell you how you should use language that's different from descriptive grammar. Descriptive grammar is what we do in linguistics. Descriptive grammar is a description of how you actually do use language. It's not a collection of statements that say this is what you should do. It's a collection of statements that say this is what you actually do do. 
So descriptive grammar is a description of language as it's actually spoken, signed, and or written. Prescriptive grammar is someone's set of ideas and rules for how a language should be spoken, signed, or written. So I'm going to be talking a lot about grammar in this class. When I say grammar, I mean a descriptive grammar. I do not mean prescriptive grammar. The point of this class is not to tell you how you should speak, it's to allow you to scientifically analyze how you actually do speak. So as an example of this idea of prescriptive grammar, just to um, show you that this idea of prescriptive grammar is maybe uh, does not really correspond to language as it's actually used. Before the 18th century, we had a word thou in English. The word thou was used to address one person. I would say thou art here to one person. And if I'm talking to multiple people, I would have said you are here. So thou was used to talk to one person, you was used to talk to many people. And this started to shift. Languages change over time. This started to shift in the really much before the 18th century, but it started to become extremely prevalent in the 18th century that basically no one used thou anymore. And this is what people thought about that as it was happening in the 18th century. So this is a tract, a text that someone wrote about uh, what he thought about the usage of the word you instead of the word thou. Uh, he said, again, the corrupt and unsound form of speech, an unsound form of speaking in the plural number to a single person, you for one instead of thou, contrary to the pure, plain, and single language of truth, thou to one and you to more than one, which has always been used, always, by God to men and men to God, as well as one to another from the oldest record of time, till corrupt men for corrupt ends, in later and corrupt times to flatter, fawn, and work upon the corrupt nature of men, brought in that false and senseless way of speaking you to one, which hath since corrupted the modern languages, not just English apparently, and hath greatly debased the spirits and depraved the manners of men. This evil and goes on like this for many pages. So this what was happening here was that the language, as you would describe it in a descriptive grammar, was changing. If you wrote a descriptive grammar of the English language in like the 16th century, it would have said you use thou to one person and you to multiple people. And then the language changed. By the 18th century, a descriptive grammar would have said you use you to refer to any number of people. But um, when languages change like this, sometimes people want to keep them the same, and then you get prescriptive grammar. You're saying that you have people saying this is how you should speak, not this is how you do speak. And there are analogs going on today. People who are trying to tell you how you should speak are often uh, trying to preserve older forms of the language, including current debates about pronoun usage. Look somewhat some 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 of the modern attitudes toward pronoun look similar to this 18th century fellow. So in some cases, these prescriptive rules are intended to preserve older forms of the language. But that's actually not always the case. In many cases, the prescriptive rules that you have heard are not rules that anyone ever actually followed in the past. So they were never actually descriptive rules. For example, this distinction between less and fewer, like you're supposed to say fewer customers instead of less customers. No one actually had a problem with this until someone wrote some style advice in 1770. Robert Baker wrote, uh, the, this word is most commonly used in speaking of a number where I think fewer would do better. No fewer than 100 appears to be not only more elegant than no less than 100, but more strictly proper. So note that uh, Robert Baker here is not actually saying this is the correct way of speaking. He's just saying, yeah, I, I think it sounds kind of better when you use fewer. And, and fair enough, you know, maybe uh, in maybe in 1770, it actually did sound a bit, you know, smoother and more idiomatic to use fewer instead of less. But then somehow people seized on this suggestion that Robert Baker made, and they turned it into a rule, and they turned it into the idea that it's actually wrong somehow to use less rather than fewer. When in fact people said stuff like less words, less customers, as early as 888 A.D. In the English language. So sometimes these prescriptive rules come from sort of fossilized relics of how the language actually did used to be used, and sometimes they're just kind of made up, like this less fewer distinction. So basically prescriptive grammar is not what we want to be studying in linguistics. Prescriptive grammar consists of either 
old descriptions of the language, which someone is trying to preserve, or they consist of sort of made up guidelines that someone has for how you should speak. So is prescriptive grammar wrong? We're going to be studying descriptive grammar in this class. Is prescriptive grammar wrong? Are some forms of language actually more correct than others? Well, that's not the kind of question that we can answer as linguists. As linguists, we are scientists. Scientists are concerned with studying and observing and describing and theorizing about the world, how the world actually is. We don't talk about how the world should be. We don't tell you how you should talk. We are describing how you do talk. So is prescriptive grammar wrong? That's not a question for me. That's a question for whoever it is, that, uh, or maybe yourself, that determines how you should act. It's not a linguist's job to regulate language. So we're going to be working on descriptive grammars, scientific descriptions of language as they actually are, not as someone thinks they should be. And here's an example of what that looks like. Here's an example of an English sentence. I'm going to call this sentence grammatical in the English language. What I mean when I say it's grammatical is that this is the kind of sentence that an English speaker might produce in some circumstance. So there is some circumstance you can think of in which an English speaker might say this, I ate the chocolate. On the other hand, chocolate the eight I. Is there any circumstance under which an English speaker would really say this? No. We say this is ungrammatical in English. Grammatical means that it's something someone would actually say. Ungrammatical means it's not something someone would say unless they're experiencing um, uh, the chocolate ate the eight I, unless they're maybe joking around by saying words in a random order. They're not really speaking English. Grammatical means that it's something that an English speaker would actually say in English. And you can also say something is grammatical in Spanish if it's something someone would say in Spanish. You can say something's grammatical in cosa if it's something someone would say in cosa. Ungrammatical does not mean that something violates a prescriptive rule. It just means it's not something someone would say. Here's another example. Colorless green ideas sleep furiously. Is this grammatical in English? Well, remember, grammatical means it's something that someone would say no matter how unusual the circumstance. It's something someone would say under any circumstance. So it's hard to think of a context. It's hard to think of a scenario where you'd really want to say something as absurd as colorless green ideas sleep furiously. But there is such a circumstance. You can come up with a context that looks like that where you would actually say colorless green ideas sleep furiously. This is grammatical in English because no matter how crazy the meaning is, it still follows the descriptive rules of the language. It makes sense. It brings to mind a sort of crazy image, but it brings to mind an image. So it is grammatical. On the other hand, this one, furiously, sleep, ideas, green, colorless, this is not grammatical in English. This is not something an English speaker would say, no matter how crazy the circumstance. This just looks like a random bunch of words that have been thrown together. So this is what we mean by grammatical and ungrammatical. This is what we mean by descriptive grammar. We're going to be trying to define the grammatical rules that you actually do follow. So grammar is not just something you find in a book. As a native speaker of a language, you have an intuition about what you can say in the language. You have an intuition that says colorless green thoughts sleep furiously is something I could say. And furiously sleep thoughts green colorless is not something you could say. This means that unconsciously, you know you have mastered some rules of the language. This knowledge that you have is what's called mental grammar. Mental grammar refers to your own implicit intuitive knowledge that tells you what you can say in your language and what you can't say in your language. We say an utterance is grammatical if it follows the rules that you unconsciously know. It's ungrammatical if it doesn't.